Hi everybody, this is Greg Pedix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Pedixonian Institute of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to look at Beware, number two, from Marvel Comics. Uh, this is one of their uh, many uh, horror reprint titles they did in the early 70s. Marvel was kind of trying to um, glut the market to uh, try to take the number one spot away from DC, which uh, they wanted to do for a while. So they were just putting out so much stuff. And then on top of that, it wasn't enough. There weren't enough artists to draw the new stuff. So they figured we can reprint all of our old 50s Atlas horror comics because DC is having uh, some measure of success with their House of Mystery and House of Secrets titles. Those were all new, though. Marvel didn't want to be bothered with that. So they just figured we'll make these reprints. So this came out in 1973, but all the comics in it are from 1950-something. Uh, but... Some of these might be pre-code. They're kind of gruesome at, at points. But, um, because I think the code had loosened up by this point. So they might be able to get away with doing some pre-code stuff in 1973. Um, they had new covers to make it feel like you were getting a new comic. Like this guy's wearing like a leisure suit. Like he's from the 70s. Inside we'll see he's wearing a fedora. And he's obviously a guy from the 50s. So they're, you know, tricking kids into buying these. Thinking it's like a... House of Secrets or House of Mystery, but they weren't. But these reprints are great because they showcase some amazing pre-code artwork and post-code. But uh, let's start with the first story, Blind Date. This is uh, drawn by Mike Sikowski, inked by Vic Carabata. There's a question mark. Um, a lot of these are unsigned, so I had to go to the Grand Comics database. Mike Sikowski uh, did, God, I don't know, scores? Dozens of... Uh, of Justice League of America comics. he He's around forever, this guy. But this is back when he was uh, raw and uh, gritty. So uh, this art is really nice. This is, a lot of work goes into it. So this guy is kind of an ass. He's this, you know, grifter type um, hoodlum. And uh, he sees this woman, a beautiful redhead, parked outside of the place he just left. The horse track place so um he goes up to her and she's basically like not interested you know i don't flirt with strange men but he just keeps hounding her and hounding her and then he just gets in the car and she's like please get out of the car i'm gonna call the police he, he's just not having it he's a pushy asshole so she's basically just telling him i hate you please get out of my car you're the most obnoxious person i've ever met he doesn't care this guy just you know, he's a masher, as they used to say. So uh, she says, she tells him that I'm actually here to meet someone. But uh, he says, ah, oh, well, he's late. You might as well take me. And she's like, very well. So she's uh, driving to this, like, hot spot that he knows about. He wants to take her. But she takes him somewhere else. She's like, I know a shortcut. Then we go back to the bar where he came out of the the horse betting place, and this old guy shows up. He's pretty decrepit. Seems uh, he's not uh, doing too well. And he says, oh, it was a blind date. This woman just called me up or wrote me a letter, I think, and told me to meet her here. Yeah, she called him up. So this guy is, like, coughing really bad. And these guys are like, are you okay, mister? And uh, he's like, it's my heart. It's been acting up on me. So... He gets back in his car, and he's feeling a little better. He's still coughing, though. And then we go back to the couple, and the beautiful redhead starts to change a little. That's that creepy little drawing right there by Mike Sikowski. And she's driving faster and faster. And he's like, please slow down, slow down. Let me out. And uh, he says, I'm going to I'm gonna beat your brains out. And she says, you can't. You're losing your strength by the second. And then she's heading right for a mountain. And uh, she tells him that my outward appearance is only a disguise. And he screams, yeah. And it's death. The woman was actually death. She was there to pick up that old guy. But uh, he missed his date with death. Um, so I guess he gets to live for a little longer with his bad heart. And this, uh, this hoodlum uh, takes his place. Very silly, but really just fun, nice art and good stuff. 
Okay, this is amazing to me. This is Gene Colan back in the 50s. Look at this stuff. This is terrific. Um, you can still see some of Gene Colan's, you know, what he became to be with the, you know, the heavy use of shadows and moody art. And this, this story is called O'Malley's Friend, um, unknown writer. It's a pretty good story, though. I like this one. So there's this old guy in a, we find out he's in a bar and he's telling him a story. The strangest story ever told. He's telling the patrons. So there was this guy named O'Malley and his wife, and they're really poor. They barely had any food to eat. One night, he gets a crust of bread for dinner, and she's like, if you weren't such a lazy good for nothing, you would have more to eat. So he's like, okay, fine, you're right. I'll just eat this and be happy. But then there's a knock on the door, and it's this old drifter. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, he shares his last piece of bread with him. The drifter says, I'm really hungry. Can you help me out? He's like, sure. So this guy says that, you know, I'm actually St. Peter. And he doesn't believe him, but he proves it. He turns into St. Peter right in his, uh, in his kitchen. And he says, I'll give you two wishes. And he asks for some strange wishes. The first wish is that anyone who sits down in that, that chair that you're sitting in will not be able to get up until I allow him to. My second wish is that anyone who touches my coat on that hook will not be able to let go until I allow him to. And St. Peter says, those are weird wishes, huh? And then all of a sudden, um, well, of course, the wife gives him shit for making such stupid wishes. She was like, why don't you, you know, ask for, you know, a ton of gold? But um, so all of a sudden the devil pops up for some reason. Not quite, quite sure why just then. And uh, he says, eh, make yourself comfortable, devil guy. I'm just going to go get my coat. Sit down and rest your feet. So the devil sits in that chair. And, uh, yeah, you can totally see nascent uh, Gene Colan as what he'd end up being. I really like this art, though, the combination of what Gene Colan became and what he was. You can see glimpses of both. Um, there's a weird, that's pretty weird shading. And, oh, man, that's good stuff. So then the devil realizes he can't get out of the chair because the wish he made. And then him and his wife beat the shit out of the devil with, like, I don't know, baseball bats and broom handles. And they basically uh, say, uh, give us the money. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, he gives them a bunch of money. And the devil makes a deal. He says, okay, I'll give you all the riches you want. And I won't bother you for seven years. Let me loose. So they accept the bargain, and the devil gets the hell out of there. He's like, I'll be back in seven years. And then for the next seven years, they enjoy a life of luxury and plenty. And they have a gay old time, him and his wife. This montage is kind of strange, though. It doesn't show like they're doing much, like they're smoking cigarettes. Um, they're dancing at a bar. I guess that's kind of nice to do, but none of this shows that they're that rich, except for these coins flowing through the air. I mean, just sitting and smoking cigarettes isn't really that luxurious. So then seven years later, the devil comes back and he's pleased as punch. And he's, he doesn't raise a fuss, O'Malley. He says, oh, okay, let me get my coat. Why don't you sit down for a minute? And he says, oh, no, you're not going to trick me with the chair again. I'll get the coat for you. And he grabs the coat and he can't let go because the second wish. And then O'Malley... Beats the crap out of him again with a cane. Because his hands, he can't let go of the coat. And uh, the devil is just like, stop, stop. I'll give you the gold. I'll never bother you again. So uh, the devil runs off saying, I hope I never see you troublemakers again. You guys are the worst. There's a nascent colon. You can see where he's going to end up soon. Once again, they're living the high life. He's smoking, so apparently we know they're rich. And they lived happily for the next 20 years, but then O'Malley dies. So, yeah, I love this panel. Look at that, a beautifully silhouetted tree. It's his funeral day. And the colorist really uh, did a nice choice there. So he walks up to heaven, and he sees St. Peter. He's like, hey, I wonder if he'll remember me. 
And he's like, sorry, O'Malley, but you lived too rich and sinful a life. He says, where will I go? He's like, well, give, give, give it a shot down there. Points to hell. So O'Malley turns away from the gates of paradise and goes towards hell. And uh, there's a nice panel right there. So he knocks on the doors of hell. And uh, the devil sends his little imp guy. <laughs> it's kind of funny looking. And he says, hey, it's that fellow O'Malley you were telling us about. He's like, O'Malley, get out. I never want to see you again, troublemaker. And O'Malley's like, but where will I go? I'm dead. He's like, that's none of our business. Just get the hell away from here. So O'Malley just crawls away back up to, uh, I don't know, purgatory. He's got nowhere to go. And so now we go back to the present. We see the storyteller here. And um, he tells him that uh, O'Malley had nothing to do but wander around. And so they say, whatever happened to O'Malley? And he says, why nothing happened? There was just no place to go. So here I am. Let's have another round of drinks. So I guess this guy will just be alive forever since heaven and hell both don't want him. This comic is uh, drawn by John Forte. Uh, did uh, lots of under, I'm sorry, not underground, uh, golden age comics uh, for Fiction House. And just, uh, you know, did the rounds of, like all the of all the publishers back then. So in the 50s, he's still drawing, working at Atlas. And this is just pretty stupid, this story. Um, he's a pretty smart inventor. He works with this company. He's in, uh, invented a space transmitter so he could contact other wor worlds. The boss says, oh, that's a stupid invention. How are we going to make money off that? And the boss obviously doesn't like him. He's got his, this guy's got his head in the clouds. He's like, science is, uh, you know, worthy just for itself. Pure science is good. This guy just wants to make a profit. That's all he cares about with the scientific achievement. So he makes his space transmitter and he sends out a beam, but nobody answers back. He sends it out into deep space. So the boss says, you're fired. And, uh, and then the guy tries to save his job. He says, I'll just do practical things from now on. He's like, nothing doing, you're fired. So he feels like a failure. And then we cut away to this far distant planet, it's a laboratory. And uh, this guy's saying, hey, it's true. There was a signal, it was really weak, but it was a signal. And the other guy says, the planet must be inhabited. This calls for a change of plans immediately. And <laughs> apparently this other world was gonna try out their atomic cannons on Earth, which is like half a galaxy away. I don't know why they were deci decided destroy a whole planet just to test their guns out. You, you know, they could try asteroids or something, but, but you know, very silly. So it turns out inadvertently he saved the world and uh, he's happy with his wife and she has this woman's intuition that uh, I feel like you haven't failed today. I think you uh, did well. Very dumb. Oh, this is even dumber. This is a uh, well, we know Stan Lee wrote it because, of course, Stan Lee has to sign it. Doesn't let the artist sign it, but uh, egomaniac Stan Lee signs it. I don't know why he would sign this. This is terrible. I don't know why he would uh, take credit for this. But there's this deadbeat guy, and he wants to see this new movie called The Man from Mars. But um, he has no money. So he goes to his mom, his hardworking mom. And she's like, give me a buck, ma. He's like, a dollar. I just gave you five dollars yesterday. He said you'd get a job. You know, this guy's just a total asshole. He's just a deadbeat. You know, he's got, he's a narcissist. He doesn't give a shit about who he has to, whatever. So he's some, he doesn't get the money, but he's like, oh, I'll figure out a way to get in. So on the way there, he sees this, like, publicity stunt, he thinks. If you want to see Mars enter, it's like a model of a spaceship. And he figures, oh, it's a way to advertise this movie. But he's the only one in there. And uh, and the voice, there's a voice that says, yeah, you get to see the movie for free. And everyone else is looking on in envy because the door closes. And uh, But then there's a loud whoosh and a puff of smoke and he falls unconscious. And it was a real spaceship. Because when he wakes up, he's on Mars in an Earth zoo. I'm sorry, a Mars zoo, a Martian zoo. They've got someone from the moon, someone from Venus, and someone from Earth. 
this deadbeat guy. And I guess that's supposed to be a Martian? <laughs> Not very exotic or, you know, alien looking. So, yeah, really dumb story. But yeah, it's decent, I guess. That's not so bad. And uh, I forgot to say who the artist is by. I uh, looked this up before. Oh, it's Bob Fujitani, another great uh, Golden Age artist. He worked for uh, Lev Gleason, uh, Quality. He worked for a lot of the good companies of the underground era. This last story I really like. I never heard of this guy. It's drawn by a man named Bill Benoulis. And uh, it's just, look at the style of this guy. I don't know. It's almost like he could be some weird underground cartoonist or just a very distinctive way of drawing characters. But I don't know if this is like a chop at Stan Lee because the, the villain of this piece is an editor for a magazine company. It looks like, you know, they're pulps. And he's just a tyrant. He's an asshole. He even like has um, some of the people on his payroll spy for him. And, you know, tell him if anyone's, you know, bad-mouthing him. And then he fires them if he, they do. And he fires this one guy, even though, like, he's got a white a kid on the way. And everyone's, like, you know, the scuttlebutt is that people are really mad at him. So he orders that all these um, speakers be put into every office in the building. I like this drawing here. I almost suspect that these are, like, Atlas staffers. They all have distinctive faces, like their caricatures of maybe his co-workers. Maybe this really is a chop at Stan Lee. It's like, supposedly this is Atlas. And, but yeah, that's some well-drawn stuff. So, but the speakers, he can hear. Everyone just thinks it's like, um, so he can announce, make announcements. So he's, he's dropping on everyone, and they're all talking shit about him because he's a bastard. And he retaliates, firing more people. And, uh... Anyone who's, like, saying some bad shit about him, he's firing. So this is where this story just, it makes no sense. So just because he put in these transmitters and he's a jerk, all of a sudden this creepy voice comes on the radio one day. Another great drawing. Um, and it says, imagine, clear your mind and picture what I'm telling you. A funeral parlor, you're in the casket. And then you're dead and buried, there'll be the fire and brimstone. And this is interesting here. These cute little demons, they look like little men from Mars. Or, you know, like they'd hang out with Fred Flintstone. And uh, especially because they're pretty, the colorist made them all green, which, you know, I don't really associate that color with hell. And then the thousands of tortures for all eternity. So this looks more like hell. These crazy demons. This one looks like Godzilla. And he's ripping his cloak. I don't know what he's ripping, his shoulder? He's getting water torture. He's in hell for all eternity for his evilness. And this guy is just like, oh, I must have fallen in a trance. What the hell's going on? And then there's the last panel. And the, the skull comes out. And he says, that you shouldn't have asked. What he says, what are you? He asks him, what are you? And he says, that you haven't, shouldn't have asked. Very bad, bad, you know, last line of a story. It's just kind of, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. There was nothing weird about this radio. They didn't say they found it in a, a haunted house or anything. But that is a pretty cool, creepy image. You know, look, look at the Kirby Crackle. Before Kirby was using Crackle, it looks like Kirby Crackle. So that's it for Beware, number two. Um, I love these 70s Marvel reprints, the, um, you know, I have all the EC comics, and these were all rip-offs of that. Every company back then was trying to rip off EC's horror comics. None of them were even close to the level of quality of EC. But there's something about them. They're, they're just kind of shittiness. <laughs> I don't know. Some of the art is insane. Like, really crazy styles. I think because they just let these artists do whatever they wanted as long as it looked creepy and scary. So artists could, you know, kind of show off and show a more personal art style but yeah that's it we're going to be looking at some more of these I just got a big stack and I read some comic sale and I want to show off some more of these but uh, I'm trying to find all of these I got a pretty decent collection uh, the Pedixonian has a pretty decent collection of these 70s Marvel reprints and uh, almost all of them have some really interesting artwork in them and uh, I guess that's it 
Thanks for watching, and I hope you liked it, and I'll see you next time.